Do you feel it? Is it going? Yes. And where do I plug go? Where do you want to stick the pack? I can stick it on my own. Good morning. Welcome to Fuller Chapel, to those in the room and to those watching online. We're so glad you could join us this morning. We're going to continue this posture of stillness uh, through a time of listening and prayer. So I invite everyone to close your eyes, to enter that inner space where you commune with God. And as you do, call to mind a time when you felt the pang of loneliness or isolation. Perhaps you're in that space right now in your life. Perhaps you know someone who is in that space now in their life. Whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation, this is an invitation to be honest and to be in that place and to bring it fully with all of yourself.
as we hear these words, may they be our deep cry, may they be our prayer. Lord, sometimes I don't know what to do with myself. When I am faced with the heaviness of the night, when I feel alone, when I am ashamed, when I fear that I will not be accepted, and I interpret my cries as inconvenience, oh God, my body is tired, my thoughts are tired, my spirit is tired, and, and I long for someone to sit here with me. If I reach for them, will they find me? God, as a community, we how to reach out in love to those who feel isolated and lonely. Sometimes, Lord, we don't see them. And sometimes it's that we don't know what to say or how to start. And we wonder if we reach for them, will they let us in? So will you teach us how to reach and to keep reaching? Will you teach us how to sit in the dark together? Will you remind us when we forget that being present is also a prayer, is also a language? We lift up our brothers and sisters. For the one who couldn't get out of bed today, we reach out in love. For the one who is trapped in thoughts that are unkind toward themselves, we reach out in love. For the one whose trust and personhood have been abused, we reach out in love. For the one who longs for friendship, we reach out in love. For the ones whose hearts are heavy and day, we reach out in love. For those who have been excluded, bullied, pushed out, and mistreated, we reach out in love. For those who carry trauma, illness, and pain in their bodies, for those who care for those bodies, we reach out in love. For all who wade in the blessed unrest, we reach out in love. So let us press our ears to the ground. Let us listen for the deep, deep truths. And when we hear the sound of the holy coming close, oh, brothers and sisters of the earth, oh, beloved, let us run out to meet her. As we say in the name of Jesus, amen. that we're part of one body. Sing with me, I need you. Survive. Sing this. 
bed again. I need you. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're part of God's body. It is His will that every need be supplied. You are important. I need you to As we journey from isolation to community, I am reminded so much of the journey for many deaf, deaf blind, and hard of hearing individuals. Both of my parents are deaf, and more specifically, my mom, being deaf and adopted from Taiwan, was frequently in isolation throughout childhood. And it was not by choice. Able to hear side conversation and jokes, not only at school, but in the home and her family. She was conditioned to believe she had to speak English, had to act hearing in order to belong. And this marked many of her early years. It wasn't until college that she found her deaf identity, and that's capital D, deaf identity her language, her culture. Finally, surrounded by others who could communicate with her, joke with her, lament with life with her through the rich cultural and linguistic heritage of the deaf, she moved from isolation to community. 
unlike many of our deaf and hard of hearing brothers and sisters, today we have a choice to move from isolation. To American Sign Language, my first language, is a live, visual, expressive language that uses the entire body. The essence of the language is being present with the other. It's expressing oneself through embodied movement and truly seeing one another. And I think we crave, we long for honest and authentic connection with one another. You know, in English and many other audible languages, you can talk to someone without even looking at them. I can be looking to the side and still be talking to you and you can hear me and understand me. You can be talking on the phone or you can be looking at your phone but talking to someone else. And in ASL, the beauty of it is that's just not possible. You have to be face to face. You have to be present with one another. So today I invite you to step out of your comfort zone of audible language, recognizing that God's primary language is not English and nor is it audible as we pass the peace to one another in sign. So I talked with my mom and technically in sign language, she really just said, uh, may the peace of God be with you in sign that's may God be with you. So today I'm gonna teach us how to sign God be with you. Um, if you are able, willing and able to rise and stand with me and kind of maybe shake it out because it is embodied. So stick figures, you know. So let's take our right or left hand, whatever you prefer and make a B like this. And then you're gonna go from your head and pull it down. That's God, God, great. And then we're going to say with. So take two fists and pull them together with you. And the important part about this is actually not just the movements themselves, but your facial expression, right? We can't just be signing. Like, what does that say? You know, what am I saying? So your facial expressions communicate so much. That's 75% of American Sign Language. So as we pass the piece to one another, I encourage you just to use whatever expression you've got. Maybe it's a smile. Maybe you're a little fatigued and tired. Deaf people are very blunt, so feel free to be blunt with your expressions. <laughs> yes, we can handle it. And, and make eye contact with each other. I know some of us that's uncomfortable depending on our cultural background, but in ASL, that's part of the culture is to see each other. So let's practice one more time. God, with you, I invite you to pass the peace. be seated. <clears throat> Have, Have mercy, mercy on me, God, according, according to your faithful love. love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin. I've sinned against you, you alone. I've committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you render your verdict, completely correct when you issue your judgment. Yes, I was born in guilt, in sin, from the moment my mother conceived me. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. 
Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy in celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away all my guilty deeds. Create a clean heart for me, God. Put a new faithful spirit deep inside me. Please, out of your presence, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Then I ways, and sinners will come back to you. Let us pray. God, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to be open to what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Community can be oh so beautiful. Look at us, right? And community can be so painful. Look at us. <laughs> on the surface, all looks well in this room and online. We're, we're a good looking bunch. But if you peel back one layer, the good, the bad, the unspeakable truth of us is available to see if we, if we just look a little closer. Our, our unmet longings, our unknown futures, they all commingle here. Things aren't always as they seem. And it's the same with this Psalm 51, one of seven penitential Psalms. At first read, its tone is humble and meek, an eager cry for mercy. But if we pull back the curtains, my friends, this prayer is brimming with scandal and lust and abduction and rape and murder. The stuff our community and perhaps our own lives are made of. So to appreciate the fullness of this prayer, we must remember who is confessing and what he's repenting of. We remember the story of David and Bathsheba in Samuel, 2 Samuel 12. And we remember the confrontation of Nathan the prophet in 2 Samuel as well. So let's do that now. We're going to bookmark Psalm 51 and we're gonna put this text in context, shall we? Amen? Amen? Yes, so many of us know the story. David stays home from war. He sends Joab in his stead. While Israel is waging a war against the Ammonites, David is losing the greatest battle of his life. He goes from peeping Tom to wielding his power and his privilege and he's having his vulnerable woman. Later, there's a murder cover-up and an innocent child's life is lost in the balance. The scripture is clear in 2 Samuel. It says what David did to Bathsheba and to her husband displeased the Lord. And so God does what God does. God sends the prophetic voice to David and knocks on David's door and gives him a parable, a parable about sheep, hoping to appeal to David's shepherd heart. A rich man has all these sheep. And a poor man has only one precious, innocent lamb. I love how God portrays Bathsheba as precious and innocent. And he portrays this parable where the rich man takes the one sheep of the poor man and uses his privilege and destroys the family and destroys the, 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 the um, abundance of this, of this poor man, what he has. And David is face to face with his sin. Face to face. And David, not able to see himself in his own story, passes judgment where he'll be soon begging for mercy. And Nathan looks past the log in David's eyes and says, you are the man. And David at this point, he's so tired of hiding. He's so tired of his shame. He's so tired of avoiding Bathsheba as he walks by her quarters. He's so tired of all the gossip within the palace that he says, yes, I've sinned, that he dusts off his harp, and Psalm 51 is born. All of David, the real David, shows up in Psalm 51. 
It's his life sung in this ensemble. It's his shame sandwiched between the stanzas. It's the minor chords of his guilt and his shame holding the melody of this song in place. This is a weighty, intimate prayer we are invited into this morning. And friends, in this psalm, there are a few reminders I believe we need to bring to our community. David knows all too well that we bring our broken and beloved selves with us wherever we go. And Bathsheba will affirm that the unspeakable damage that one person does and an unrepentant heart can damage an entire community. Thankfully, God has a remedy for us. There's a prayer for that, like there's an app for that. There's a prayer for that. <laughs> psalm 51. So let's take a look quickly at this psalm. And this sermon is not for your neighbor. <laughs> it's not. David, in verses 1 to 3, I just had to put that in there. David, <laughs> verses 1 to 3, finally acknowledges his unfaithfulness. And he pleads for the faithful love of God. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your great compassion. Blot out my sins. Wash out my stains. Purge me. Cleanse me completely. Unsin me. And it takes a while for David to get to this place. You know why? Because it's easier for us to name situations where we have been mistreated rather than confess, confess ways in which we've acted unfairly. So in our community, we can become fixated on what is wrong with the other person, unbeknownst to us that we're becoming the very thing that we despise. Remember, David was the youngest brother born into privilege. He was out tending sheep, a king in disguise, marginalized in his own family, overlooked by his own father, mistreated by his brothers. He worked under the oppressive leadership of King Saul for seven years and was on the run for four years. But look at how David has transitioned from the oppressed to the oppressor. The man who once risked his life against lions and bears to protect his father's sheep is now the predator stealing and destroying the precious lamb Bathsheba. The godly David who was given the chance to, to avenge himself of Saul passes it up in the name of integrity twice. But now he kills Uriah in cold blood. Friends, be careful. Institutional and sin, institutional sin and power without accountability, y'all, that is as old as dirt. You're always going to face that. But you know the greater danger is becoming the thing that we're praying against. Can we keep our hearts pure as we travel through this space? Something of Saul rubbed off on David. And it happens in all of our lives, in our churches, in our families, at Fuller. In when you pass through this place, you'll get a piece of paper. You'll get a therapy practice. You might get a minted PhD. You'll get your research published. But is your heart pure? My God, that we would never leave this place becoming the things about this place that we despise. And Saul's on the unfailing love of God because that's an unlimited resource. My love is limited. I am fully human. But God's unfailing love, it's the most consistent thing about God. And friends, we need that to survive. We need each other. And we need to see each other through faith, with love, is your job. Guarding someone else's heart is she praying Psalm 51? Is, is he repenting? Is he doing the right thing? That's their job. And so David says, love me with your love because my heart is gone cold. My, dust, my, my heart is covered with dust. Need your mercy. Not just for what I've done, but who I've become. Let's keep moving. And this is where I'm going to spend the most of our time. Are you all all right? Yes. In verses 4 to 5, and this is where I wrestled with David and I get mad at him a lot. He says, against God alone, I've sinned and done what is evil in God's sight. Now, I am no psychologist, Dr. Abernathy. But it sounds like David is stuck in the denial stage in Kubler-Ross's grief cycle. <laughs> He's only sinned against God. What about Bathsheba and Joab and, and Uriah? 
and all the messengers who are going back and forth and have no idea they're an accomplice to murder, using his staff members to do the unthinkable. What about all the people under David's leadership who thought that they could trust him to do the right thing? What about the concubine who now will have to welcome another sister bride under very suspect circumstances? What about the innocent baby who doesn't get to tell its own story? You've only heard God. <laughs> but here's something that I see here in this text. What David did in secret is going to be played out for generations in his family. Traumatizing cycles of rape and deception and murder and violence. And his own soul is broken. His own body, his bones are crushed. Here's the hard truth about David's story and ours. Every person he a member of his community. And God says, if you hurt my body, you're hurting me. He was relationally connected. Bathsheba lived close enough to David to be seen and to be vulnerable and to be hurt. Friends, when you live in community and work with each other, we're going to hurt each other. Someone in this room has been hurt by someone in this room. Can I hear an amen? Someone in your department has been hurt by someone in their department. Someone in a meeting has been thrown under the bus by someone in that meeting. And guess what? We can't opt out of that meeting. We have to keep up showing up every single week. Proximity increases our vulnerability. And we get to practice being like Christ with those closest to us. How are we doing? Taking care and stewarding each other here. And God says, how you steward each other, that's how you're relating to me. Friends, uh, we have a year with a contentious election coming up. We live in tight quarters. We intermix with a diverse set of... Our voices and convictions and our cultures are as diverse as, look at our room, look at us. Our future is unknown. As people of the cross, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we don't always make it a practice to repent. There's a prayer for that. There's a prayer for this. There's a prayer for us. Psalm 51 is calling us to examine our hearts. Because when my heart is free, guess what? Liberation exists for all of us. If I'm liberated, if I'm bound, all of us are bound. And if I hate you, I really am hating God. How can I not love you and say that I love a God that I've not even seen? It's impossible. It's, there are a lot of pastors in this room, but I'm showing up today as one of your pastors. We are being called to reckon with the way we treat one another. Amen. We're being called to it. And we have to know that how I treat you isn't just some passing thing or retaliation or, you know, it was just that thing. It is a sign of our deepest relationship with God. Years ago, I spent weeks in Ireland at a Cistercian Abbey joining the community's daily charism. And I prayed with the monks from before dawn until evening Compline for weeks. And immersed in the Psalter, I started to sense my own need to be forgiven. And in a diary, I began to write a list of all the people I hurt, little things from young to bigger things uh, where I knew I was knowingly rebelling against God. And by the end of my chronicles, I had written a 10-ton list. <laughs> and you know what I found? I found that anything I did to someone, or even anything that was done to me, was in fact a violation against God's basic precepts. And on the final day of my stay with the monks, um, before heading to the airport, I asked the guest master to help me burn my diary. I'm that girl. And so I didn't want to carry its weight back to the U.S. with me. And so we stood under a ledge in the rain with two matches under a broken umbrella. The monk is trying to light a flame. And we lose <laughs> one match right away. And with one match left under that broken umbrella in that unrelenting Irish rain, we refuse to give up, and we have an impatient. And so the monk covers my hands in his to shield the little flame that is caught. And we have four palms now turned inward at my pain. And in that moment, I realize unconfessed sin wants to stubbornly stay alive in me. It separates me from God. Unconfessed sin is the ultimate betrayal. 
And so warm tears stream down my face, the cold rains falling down as I watch my deepest hurts and the hurts I cause burn away. Ashes and warm tears falling to the ground and I ran to the taxi just in time with only the weight of my luggage. The psalmist has heard a lot of, but God is self-selecting as the one who actually ends up being the most hurt. When our body, the body of Christ, doesn't reflect who we are called to be. Oh, how good it is when sisters and brothers dwell together in unity. It's like the oil that rolls down Aaron's vest and falls into the ground. It's beautiful. That's the picture that God longs for. And our alliances and our bad blood and our politicking and our, and our revenge and our hatred that lives here amongst us, in us, through us, and shows up every day kills the glory of God that wants to be revealed in us. in our classes, in our meetings, in our counseling sessions, in our security rounds, processing application, advising students, hiring, firing, living as neighbors, is that we will live with awareness that what I do to you, I do to God. And I need you. I need to love you and I need to be loved by you and I need to learn how to do this beloved community. And you're my laboratory. <laughs> this is it. This is what we've got. May we join God in building a beloved image of God's kingdom. Desmond Tutu says, I love him. My, my humanity up in yours. For we can only be human together. And I will add the divinity, the image of God that is in me is bound in the Imago Dei in you. For I can only be spiritually alive in this community if we're spiritually alive together. David makes a lot of allusions to washing and cleansing and purging. I mean, this man just wants to be unsinned. And he's moved to this place where he realized, if I am cleansed, if I'm reminded, oh, we are so blessed that we have the baptism that Christ offers. We, we can be submerged as one person and come up as new. We can be submerged as one community and come up as another. And David is saying, do that in me because what I have all I have at this point is a broken spirit and a messed up story. And God says, I like that. I can do a lot with broken spirits and contrite hearts. So in this room, beloved community, you don't have to sleep with someone's wife or kill somebody Pray this prayer. Would you in this moment ask the Holy Spirit of God, who is under all of our mess, holding up this place, holding up our lives, holding up our relationships, would you ask the Spirit, God, who do I need to be, to have a clean spirit and a pure heart in this place? You don't have to sleep with someone's wife. You don't have to kill someone's husband to pray this prayer. Let God look at us and let us do the inner work. It's from the inside out that we are transformed. And it's prayers like this that puts words to things that we can't always articulate. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. And from there, I can teach others your ways. Let's take a moment, just a moment, to confess our sins before God. I'm not gonna tell you how, but I can tell you the spirit who is alive and well will reveal to you now. And all you have to say is a breath prayer. Have mercy on me, O God.
thousand times I've failed, still mercy remains. And should I stumble again, I'm caught in your embrace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all flame. My heart, my soul. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out and everlasting. Your light will shine, all else fades. You're never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out, Lord. My soul cries out. some wisdom into human insight in our spiritual lives. In an Augustinian cell, which is what a monastic room is called, not because it's punitive, but not because it's posh, <laughs> a young monk by the name of Martin would wake up every morning. His cell was not heated. In the winter, it was cold, very cold. He would see his breath in the air and breathe on his hand and it would moisten his hand. He would ask the question, what will I do this day? Young Martin would respond, this day I will live out my baptism and cross himself. He did this because it was in the church in his day. When you entered a church, there'd be a font, a place where people were baptized. And when you en entered, you would dip your hand in remembering one day you came into that church through those waters and you crossed yourself, remembering the cross that was made over you when you were baptized. Martin went on to start a reformation, but he never reformed that core understanding that his life was living out of his baptism. We've heard the word of God. It's assessment of our worth. It's assessment of our success. And we have responded silently and in song, confessing our need for forgiveness and grace and our invitation for God to cleanse us. Martin never assumed that he would live out his baptism to earn God's favor, but because he could never earn God's favor. But instead, he worked to celebrate the gift of God, the grace that he had received. So to those of you who are online, I invite you to take these next moments to remember your baptism, your faith, for all that you are thankful for that God has graciously bestowed on you, and to invite you to reflect on how you might live out that celebration of grace this day and every day. And to you, my sisters and brother in this room, I invite you to come forward and to extend either your forehead or your hand and to receive water as a sign of your baptism, asking you to remember your baptism in thanksgiving. So the words that will be said will be, remember your baptism and give thanks. And after you receive that, the person behind you will face you and you will do the same to them. You will be ushered forward should you choose to come. And this is a time for us, not silently or in song, but collectively and publicly 
to proclaim our celebration of this grace that gives us the strength to live this day. Sisters and brothers, come.
Cause Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it bright as snow community, will you receive this blessing? Friends, may you be graced with God's grace. May you be loved with God's love. And maybe you be with God's purity. And God, make this community a confessional people and a repentant place and a loving place. Start in us, God, and let it exist us. We pray this in the name of the one who submerges us in pure love and is making all things new. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Go in peace.